In 1986, writer Alan Moore and artist Steve Gibbons collaborated on Watchmen, a story that has since been almost universally hailed as one of the best comic book stories of all time. Moore and Gibbons deconstructed superheroes as we knew them, delivered an unforgettable narrative that cemented their legendary status within the industry, and also maintained a complicated relationship with their creation, especially Moore. Watchmen was a pivotal event for the comic book industry that spawned countless imitators, a movie adaptation, and soon a series on HBO. So now it's time to peel back the layers of this epic tale and share some perspective about this classic. Who watches the Watchmen? We do. We will. We will. Watch it. Anyway. Originally, Alan Moore intended to craft his tale using the Charlton Comics superheroes that DC had acquired. But because Watchmen would have left those characters nearly unusable for other writers, Moore was talked into reconfiguring his players. So Captain Atom became Dr. Manhattan, Blue Beetle inspired Night Owl, and Rorschach was inspired by both The Question and Mr. A, a lesser known creation of Steve Ditko. Watchmen has been available as a graphic novel for over 20 years, but what a lot of people forget is that it was initially published as a 12-issue miniseries, and it was David Gibbons' innovative touch to use each cover as essentially the first panel of a corresponding issue. Gibbons was well chosen as Moore's collaborator, and his incredibly detailed artwork followed Moore's dense scripts as closely as possible. That's a recipe for readers to notice something new almost every time they read through the story. For example, Rorschach appears out of costume in the third panel of page one, but his real identity wouldn't be revealed to the reader for several issues. Every detail forces the reader to pay attention. Note the Doomsday Clock headline in Ozymandias' office. By the time we get to the end of the story, that panel is revealed to really have set up the whole story in retrospect. Another signature touch was that each issue ended with a famous quote or lyric. Ranging from Bob Dylan to Elvis Costello to Albert Einstein to the Book of Genesis to many others, Moore and Gibbons were devoted to fleshing out the alternate world they created. So much so that the back pages of each issue further the narrative by providing additional context. They were so devoted, in fact, that Moore actually wrote selections from Under the Hood, an in-world autobiographical novel by Hollis Mason, the original Night Owl. This is the kind of detail that gave the audience a greater understanding about the golden age of superheroes in this world and its darker undercurrent. And it didn't stop there. See, Moore and Gibbons theorized that in a world where superheroes were real, the public would want, well, something other than superheroes from their comics. Yeah, Moore alludes to the existence of Superman and Flash comics, but in this world, they are supplanted by comics about pirates. Yes, The Watchmen features a comic book called Tales of the Black Freighter, which offers a grim tale of a mariner whose mistakes and madness led him to a dark fate, much like the actual story. See how that works? The story of Watchmen pulls the reader in with the murder of the comedian, but the mystery expands far beyond a single death. Rorschach's belief that a killer is targeting heroes inadvertently uncovers a far more interesting conspiracy. Adrian Veidt, aka Ozymandias, is the complicated figure behind most of the series' machinations. And much like the rest of the characters, he was also inspired by a Charlton hero, Peter Cannon, also known as Thunderbolt. Silk Spectre is one of the few main characters that Moore didn't retrofit from Charlton. Instead, she was more of a Black Canary and Phantom Lady analog. Silk Spectre and Night Owl were essentially the normal people at the heart of the story, as they came together out of necessity and even a bit of desperation. That led to some very suggestive pages. Gibbons and Moore were truly in command of the medium on this book, especially in issue 5, which is symmetrical. That means page 1 mirrors page 28, page 2 mirrors page 27, and it all met in the middle with pages 14 and 15. Another signature moment? The reveal of Rorschach's true identity. Interesting to note that his thumbprints in the back actually belong to Greg Weisman. He was on DC's editorial staff at the time, and these thumbprints were his contribution to the series. He'd later go on to create gargoyles for Disney and develop the spectacular Spider-Man and Young Justice animated series as well. Before the Watchmen story was even finished, Moore oversaw the creation of the Watchmen source book for the DC role-playing game, which further fleshed out the background details on the Minutemen's previous adventures and stories that mirrored the events in the main series. It's the only time Moore has officially participated in the expansion of this world, although the source book and the modules were written by Daniel Greenberg and Ray Winninger. Sometimes Moore only mentions villains, but even they got expanded and larger roles in the Watchmen The End Is Nigh video game, which is set in the movieverse. 
Zack Snyder's Watchmen movie was largely faithful to the comic, and yet the fake giant alien squid from another world was the one thing that was apparently too fantastical for the big screen. One of the ways that Moore and Gibbons made that work in the comic is that they took the time to establish the regular people outside of the main story, like the two Bernies, the doomed lesbian lovers Joey and Aline, the cops investigating the various murders, and even Rorschach's prison psychologist. That's why we care when they were caught in the middle of the plot. And every one of them was equal in death. The fact that the hero's greatest victory comes from their absolute failure is one of the reasons this still resonates today. And yet, Moore hinted that this victory could easily slip away. Upon completion of Watchmen, Moore and Gibbons were supposed to have received the rights to their characters after the series went out of print. However, it was such a perennial bestseller that DC has never allowed that to happen. Moore has never really forgiven them for that, and it led to his breaking away from DC. For years, no other comics creators dared to touch the Watchmen characters. But that changed with Before Watchmen in 2012, when several prominent artists and writers were finally persuaded to try their hand. DC is currently publishing Doomsday Clock, a story by Jeff Johns and Gary Frank that is essentially a sequel to Watchmen that brings a few of Warren Gibbons' characters into the DC universe. But the biggest expansion is Damon Lindelof's Watchmen series for HBO, which may debut as soon as 2019. Lindelof has indicated that the TV show won't be an adaptation of the comic story, and it may be set after the events depicted by Maureen Gibbons. Even HBO's announcement called back to Watchmen's closing pages because nothing ends, nothing ever ends. No matter what happens, this is a story worth experiencing. If you've never read the graphic novel, or even if it's been a minute, it's worth picking up and finishing up the dog days of summer with. You'll thank us, trust me. What are your favorite parts of Watchmen? Let us know in the comments section below.